My name is Houghton Hughes. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. And now I am 101 years old. They are voices that break a silence. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows. Witnesses to a time we only know from photographs and the written word. But they were there. Sit on that, sit on that picket fence. All day long, seeing them soldiers going back to silent zone to different places. Colored soldiers, colored soldiers in gold. Born to slavery. But we didn't have no property, we didn't have no home. And now no we can hear them speak. Because you're nothing but a dog. You're not a thing but a dog. Found voices, the slave's life, told by those who lived it. Imagine for a moment what it'll be like for Americans two or three generations hence. Assuming, of course, that we haven't blown ourselves back into the Stone Age and that someone can still figure out what format everything was in. Assuming all of that, our great-great-grandchildren will know more about us than any generation in the history of the world has ever known about its ancestors. There'll be photographs, of course, black and white and color, audio cassettes, and in a few families, 8 and 16 millimeter film, and there will be thousands upon thousands of miles of videotape on which we will have recorded everything that struck us as interesting or funny or important about the milestones of our lives and those of our friends and families. They will be able to see and hear us long after we are dead. Imagine if we could only do the same. If we could only bring back the voices and images, and most important of all, the memories of those who lived a hundred or more years ago. Well, brace yourselves for a minor miracle. For reasons I'll explain as we go along, we have the voices and the memories and a few black and white photographs to go along of some men and women who were born, some of them, 150 years ago. And what makes these recollections all the more remarkable is that these men and women had been bought and sold like so much livestock. Tell you the truth, when I think of it today, I don't know how I'm living. I remember that just as well. Look like to me, I can't. Been slaves all our lives. My mother was a slave, sister was a slave, father was a slave. They know nothing about reading right now. All that I know, the teachers of mine, your master, and your missus. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after she was broke, just turned, just like he turned some out, you know. Didn't know where to go. They are haunting voices from the past, not actors reading a script or scholars reading a text, but the actual voices of men and women, Americans, who were born in slavery. My name is Fountain Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. Incredible as it seems, we are listening to the voices of ex-slaves telling of their lives in bondage. Men like Fountain Hughes on the living conditions of slaves in Virginia in the 1860s when he was a teenager. Some people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. They all slept on the floor. Had it here, had it there. Just like a lot of uh, wild people, we didn't, we didn't know nothing. Didn't like looking no book. Women like Laura Smalley, describing the makeshift church where slaves worshipped on a big plantation in East Texas. All the church would have be a tub, tub of water sitting just like this thing is, you know, and that would catch your voice, and they would they would have church around that tub, all of them get around the tub. Or Harriet Smith, remembering what she saw as a small girl during the final days of the Civil War. We said, oh, I stood on that picket fence. 
all day long seeing them soldiers going back to San Antonio in different places. Colored soldiers. Colored soldiers in Joe. That's mm -hmm. right along by our house. Our home is a two-story house. A white These recorded memories were among thousands of interviews done with ex-slaves in the 1930s and 40s. The majority were written interviews published in pamphlets and books. A handful were recorded on the latest equipment of the day, 200-pound portable recorders that a hearty band of folklorists lugged across the South. You'd rather go free, you know. Mm -hmm. could, but I have These recordings, once scratchy, distant, filled with the crackle and pop of that primitive equipment, Nothing worries me. I'm not, my head ain't even white now have been cleaned up through the magic of modern technology, digitized. I'm the oldest one that I know that's living. The age of the computer has reached back to polish a memory from another century, 150 years ago. Can you remember slavery days very well? Of course, I remember all our white folks, and all the names of them, all the children. Call everyone the children's name. Who, who did you belong to? Jim Button, the baby boy. The results of these digitally enhanced recordings are arresting, almost unbelievable. The idea of hearing the voices of actual slaves from the plantations of the Old South is as powerful, as startling really, as if you could hear Abraham Lincoln or Robert E. Lee speak. Listen again to Fountain Hughes, who was born in 1848. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs and all like that. Have an auction bench and they put you on, up on the bench and bid on you the same as you're bidding on cattle, you know. Much of what these three former slaves say may at first seem unremarkable. Much of what they say may surprise and upset. And their calm demeanor is at odds with the evil and violence we associate with slavery. Here is 91-year-old Texan Laura Smalley talking in the 1940s about the outcome of a tussle between two women, one black, one white, one slave, one mistress. The mistress tried to slap the slave, but the black woman pushed her into a chair. Laura Smalley was a girl at the time, but she remembers vividly what happened to the black woman when the master came home. Well, they took that old woman, poor old woman, cat in the peach orchard, and whipped her. And, you know, just tied her hand this way, you know, around the peach orchard tree. I remember that just as well, looked like to me, I can't, and round the tree and whipped her. And, well, she couldn't do nothing but just kick her feet, you know, just kick her feet. But it, it just had her clothes off down to her waist, you know. They didn't have a plum naked, but they had her clothes down to her waist. And... Every now and then they'd whip her, you know, and then snuff the pipe out on her, you know. She snuffed the pipe out on her. You know, the embers in the pipe. I don't know you ever see the pipe smoking. Blow them out on her? Mm -hmm. oh, Good Lord, mm -hmm. have mercy. What is remarkable in the taped recollections of these ex-slaves is the lack of anger. Remember, though, that these are the recollections of people who were children or teenagers during slavery. Remember, too, how intimidating it is for most of us today to have a microphone or camera thrust at us and to be asked questions on the street. It must have been even more daunting for poor blacks living in a highly segregated South to be asked by white strangers using a strange machine to talk candidly about being slaves. For all that, it is startling how much the ex-slaves reveal. Fear, hunger, unrelenting work, but also fondness for masters, perhaps even love. Harriet Smith's family, for example, were the only slaves of an East Texas farmer and his family. They lived in a cabin next to their masters in circumstances not markedly different even attended the same church, only at different times. 
So I went to Mountain City to the White Folks Church in many times. See, the white folks would have church in the morning, then they'd let the colored people have church at their church in the evening. And during slavery. During slave time. Laura Smalley lived in the same area of Texas as Harriet Smith near the Brazos River, one of more than 100 slaves on a big cotton plantation. Religion offered no consolation to the slaves here because the master forbade them the practice of religion, and there was hell to pay if the master caught them at prayer. They don't have no church. No, they didn't have no church. And uh, the old master come along with one of them. One of them was, uh, was there having church around the tub, and he's down praying. The old master come in, he just a praying. He come in, he did, and told him, get up from there. He didn't get up, he just a praying. He said, the old master come in, so whoop me. He quit praying and then asked the Lord, have mercy on the old master. I said, oh, my shoulder, whoop with a bull hook. His husband, have mercy on the old master. And said, old master, whooped him and he kept up, wouldn't get up, you know, just flinch, you know, just like a person, you know, a person hits you, you know, and flinch. He just prayed for old master. The old master stepped back and said, I'm ready mind to kick you naked. I'm ready mind to kick you naked. And he can never stop praying, you know, he had he had to go on leaving praying. Hmm. <laughs> go on leaving praying. <laughs> because he wouldn't stop. The plantation on which Smalley was a slave sounds brutal. She recalls scrambling with other children for food from a huge wooden tray, like a hog trough. All of them, you know, would get around that tray with spoons and eat, such like mush or soup or something like that. And all of them children get around there and just eat, 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 eat. Fountain Hughes tells his interviewer about the relentless round of work for him on a Virginia plantation. The night never come out. You had nothing to do. Time to cut tobacco. If they want you to cut all night long out in the field, you cut. And if they want you to hang all night long, you hang, you hang tobacco. It didn't matter about your tired being tired, you're afraid to say you're tired. It was cotton, not tobacco, that solidified slavery, though. The invention of the cotton gin at the end of the 18th century made its processing easy, but the crop still needed enormous amounts of unskilled labor. Control of the slave and his labor through laws and regulations became paramount. Fountain Hughes talks about one of those controls, the pass system. Now, I couldn't go from here across the street well, I couldn't go to nobody's house without I have a note or something from my master. And if I had that pass, I don't want to call a pass. If I had that pass, I could go wherever he sent me, and I'd have to be back. You know, when I, whoever he sent me to, they, they'd give me another pass, and I'd bring that back, so it's a show how long. Even emancipation didn't truly free the slaves. Freedom freed slaves for more travail. The end of the Civil War found many cast adrift without skills and no place to go. And the Yankees who freed them weren't always seen as benevolent liberators. I remember when the Yankees came along and took all the good horses and took all the, sort of all the meat and flour and sugar and stuff out in the river and let it go down the river. And they know the people who wouldn't have nothing to live on, but they done that. The ex-slaves left one hell for another, perhaps an even more dangerous one. No longer property, they didn't have the protections afforded property. When we were slaves, we couldn't do that, see? Mm -hmm. And if we got free, we didn't know nothing to do. And my mother, she then she hunted places and bound us out for a dollar a month. But we didn't have no property, we didn't have no home. We had nowhere, nothing, we didn't have nothing on it, just to like the cattle, we were just turned out and uh, get along the best you could. In Texas, the slaves weren't told they were free until two months after the war ended. Smalley remembers that her masters gave the slaves a dinner and then they were free. I don't know how the other side of the folks know freedom. We didn't know. 
They just thought, you know, we just feeding us, you know. Them, them didn't know where to go. You see, after feeding them, broke, just turn, just like he turned some out, you know. They didn't know where to go. That's just where they stayed. Mm -hmm. you know, right. Didn't know where to go. Turn us out just like, you know, you turn out cattle. <laughs> In the narratives, the slaves used an interesting phrase for the end of slavery. They say, when the break came. Good times, easy times, were not at hand. The trials for millions of black Americans didn't end in 1865. They continued. Laura Smalley and her family became sharecroppers. Harriet Smith's first husband was killed by whites during the Reconstruction, probably because of his political organizing. Fountain Hughes went north to Baltimore and worked at numerous jobs, including hauling manure. Not an enviable job, but it was the job of a free man. John Henry Falk was among those who interviewed ex-slaves. Falk kept detailed notebooks of his travels and interviews with former slaves and even tried once to pass for black. He told an interviewer just before his death in 1979. I really, I really I'd gotten, come educated on blacks and their problems, except we call them colored folks. If some of you think you recognize the name John Henry Falk, you're right. He was a famous radio personality in the 1950s. He was also denounced and eventually blacklisted for, among other things, championing the rights of blacks to vote. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We can thank the Depression for the existence of the slave narratives. That is when John Henry Falk, folklorist John Lomax, his son Alan, and writers like Zora Neale Hurston, the celebrated Harlem Renaissance writer, were touring the South to gather accounts of African-American folk traditions. The subject of slavery was not on their minds. Nobody was going around saying, oh, now we've got another former slave recording. But then little by little, they, they started becoming a category. Known to scholars and linguists, the audio tapes of the ex-slaves have been in the archives of the Library of Congress and various libraries around the country since the late 1940s. Kathy Farnell, who works with the Institute of Language and Culture in Clanton, Alabama, is one of the people responsible for the clarity of the ex-slave narrative tapes, now part of a recently released audio and book package called Remembering Slavery, produced by the Smithsonian Institution and Public Radio International. What I found out was that the technology did not exist to bring these recordings up to broadcast quality by taking out the background static. That technology got invented in the early 1990s. Hearing the tapes had a profound effect on everyone who worked with them. I was truly amazed when I first heard the recorded interviews. I just fell in love with Fountain. He had the type of emotions that, that I really liked. He had anger, and so it, it felt good to me. It validated for me my feeling that this was a horrible, horrible thing to happen to any people. But John Henry Falk may have experienced the most profound effect. He was a graduate student when he interviewed the former slaves, including the two women you hear in this broadcast. Himself interviewed just before he died in 1979, Falk was going on about how he believed in giving blacks the right to go to school, giving them the right to vote, giving them the right to go into anything they qualified for. And then he said he experienced an epiphany. Yeah, sitting out on a wagon tongue with this old black man and was telling him what a different kind of white man I was. I remember him looking at me very sadly and kind of sweetly and condescending and said, you know, you still got the disease, honey. I know you think you're cured, but you're not cured. You can't give me the right to be a human being. I'm born with that right. Now you can keep me from having that. If you've got all the policemen and all the jobs on your side, you can deprive me of it. But you can't give it to me. Because I was born with it just like you was. My God, it had a profound effect on me. I was furious with him. But the more I reflected on it, the more profoundly it affected me. And I realized this was where it really was. But the final word belongs to Fountain Hughes. 
When asked by his interviewer which he would rather be, free or slave, he answered with intensity. Me? Which I'd rather be? <laughs> you know what I'd rather do? If I thought, had any idea, that I'd ever be a slave again, I'd take a gun and just end it all right away. Because you're nothing but a dog. You're not a thing but a dog. I'll be back with a closing thought in a moment. At a time when we're inclined to minimize or even forget the scale of past injustices, the voices we've heard tonight have an importance far beyond their number. Professor Orlando Patterson of Harvard has written that it is not surprising that freedom and the love of it have often been born in slave-holding societies. In ancient Greece, to cite one example, among the slaveholding founders of our own country to cite another. The existence of slavery in such societies, says Professor Patterson, elevates freedom, makes it more precious, more valuable, not only to those who are not free, but to those who are. This broadcast, I'd like to add, was lovingly compiled and largely created by our own senior producer, Karen DeWitt. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, Good.